6.9 Derivatives and Integrals of the Inverse Trigonometric Functions Let's start with derivatives, beginning with the sine inverse function. If y equals sine inverse of x, we know that means x equals sine y. Taking the derivative of x with respect to y, that would tell us that dx dy equals cosine of y. Okay, since we know that sine squared of y plus cosine squared of y is equal to 1, we have that cosine squared y is equal to 1 minus sine squared y. Or in other words, the cosine of y is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1 minus sine squared y. And now we'll start to get an idea of the particulars of why some of these domain restrictions, the particular ones we discussed in the last video, were made. If you think about the function y equals sine inverse of x, well again, you know that sine inverse of x is a function that takes a number in the interval negative 1 to 1 and gives us back a number between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Again, thinking of that range as being an angle range, we're saying that puts us in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Notice that in both of those quadrants, the cosine of an angle is positive. That is, if we're in quadrant 1 or quadrant 4. Okay, that means back here where we have cosine y equals plus or minus square root 1 minus sine y squared, we can see that the only sign that's really needed there is the plus. Cosine of y will be positive when y is equal to sine inverse of x because the values will all be between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. Therefore, we can say that cosine y equals just positive square root 1 minus sine squared y. Okay, taking us back to our derivative dx dy equals cosine y that tells us dx dy equals cosine y which is square root 1 minus sine squared y. Okay notice what sine squared y is since x was sine y we know that x squared is sine squared y. Hence, we have what here on this last line? dx dy equals the square root of 1 minus x squared. And by our inverse derivative theorem, that tells us that dy dx equals 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So what we've proven here is the derivative of sine inverse is equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Obviously there would be a chain rule version that would say if I take the derivative with respect to x of sine inverse of u then what I should get is u prime over the square root of 1 minus u squared. Okay now we can quickly say something here then about the derivative of cosine inverse of x. Remember what we proved in the last video. We proved that sine inverse of x plus cosine inverse of x equals pi over 2. So that means when I'm taking the derivative of cosine inverse of x, I'm really just taking the derivative of pi over 2 minus sine inverse of x. I know the derivative of pi over 2 is 0 because that's a constant. The derivative of negative sine inverse will be the negative of the formula we just derived for the derivative of sine inverse, which was 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. Okay, putting these two together, we now have derivative formulas for sine inverse and cosine inverse. The derivative, again, of sine inverse of u is u prime over square root 1 minus u squared.
but the derivative of cosine inverse of u is negative 1 over square root 1 minus u squared. Okay, let's talk about tangent next. So if y equals tan inverse x, and we're going to use this same process, and I want you to pay attention to this process because I want you to be able to perform this sort of derivation, that is to come up with these derivatives of these inverse trig functions. This technique that we just used to prove the formulas for the derivatives of sine inverse and cosine inverse we're really going to use that same technique on the other four inverse trig functions. So think about the steps here and compare it to what we did in the last example. I rewrote that with x being expressed as a function of y, so that means x equals tan y. I took the derivative of x with respect to y. In this case, that means the derivative of tangent y, which would be secant squared y. Okay, now in the other one, what did I do? I, I used an identity, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, to try and somehow relate this derivative that I got back to my function of y that describes x. So the question here is, is there a way to relate secant squared somehow back to tangent? And so if I go fishing through my identities, it doesn't take me too long to hit on 1 plus tan squared x equals secant squared x. Or in other words, at this point, I can say dx dy equals 1 plus tan squared y. Okay, but again, What's the reason for trying to express this derivative in terms of tan y? Because tan y is x. Therefore, at this point, I could say dx dy is 1 plus x squared. And again, by the inverse derivative theorem, that means dy dx is the reciprocal. Okay, now, just to save a little time here, recall that we have that similar identity that says tan inverse of x plus cotan inverse of x equals pi over 2, similar to the one we just quoted on the last page for sine inverse and cosine inverse. And that identity allows me to conclude that the derivative of cotan inverse will be the negative of the derivative of tan inverse which will be negative 1 over 1 plus x squared. So in summary, that means the derivative of tan inverse of u is u prime over 1 plus u squared. And the derivative of cotan inverse is negative u prime over 1 plus u squared. Now we get to the unusual one of the lot, which is y equals secant inverse of x. And applying the same process, I would write x equals secant y. I would take the derivative with respect to y, and the derivative of secant would be secant tangent. So that gives me dx dy equals secant y tangent y. Using the identity tan squared y equals secant squared y minus 1, the same one we used before, that certainly means that I can write tan y as plus or minus square root secant squared y minus 1. Okay, again, I'm choosing to write this in terms of secant because my original equation expresses secant y in terms of x. And I'm trying to get this derivative in terms of that original x. So of course what this says is that tangent y is equal to plus or minus the square root of x squared minus 1. Additionally, 
the other factor in that derivative is just a secant y, which would be x itself. So when I put this together, I get that dx dy is equal to secant y, which is x, times tangent y, which is plus or minus square root x squared minus 1. Now, let's remember where tangent y is coming from. y is equal to secant inverse of x. We know the secant inverse function. gives me a value less than negative 1 or a value greater than 1. Or I should say that would be the number I would plug into the secant inverse function. And what I get back is a value that's either in quadrant 1 or a value that's in quadrant 2. And if you go back and check, that was the domain and range for the secant inverse function. So what that tells me is the y that I get when I evaluate secant inverse has to be in quadrant 1 or 2. Okay, and that's important because, again, if I think about where this factor came from, that factor was precisely the tan y that I got from right there. And what we're saying is that factor of tan y depends on what quadrant I'm in. Obviously, in this quadrant, tangent is going to be positive. In this quadrant, tangent is going to be negative. That means intrinsically in this derivative formula, there is this embedded plus or minus that I can't get rid of. Okay, what's the solution for that or what's the way around that? We're going to write that dx dy is equal to the absolute value of x times the square root of x squared minus 1. We're taking that plus or minus, that is this plus or minus that's built into that tangent, and we're absorbing it into the x. And then we're putting an absolute value on that just to tell us that there could be a plus or minus there. But the key part is we do want all of this, that is the x and the tangent put together, to be positive. Notice why. If I choose something that is an x value from this interval, let me highlight that, then what y am I going to get when I evaluate tangent y? I'm going to get something in quadrant 2. In quadrant 2, tangent will be negative. So when I take this tangent value in quadrant 2 times this x value that is also negative, I should get a positive answer. Okay, think about what would happen if I took a positive input value to the secant, fun secant inverse function. These values will get me tangent values that are between 0 and pi which are positive tangent values. Therefore, positive times positive would give me positive, and again, this factor would need to be positive. All right, that's why when I combine this x and this plus or minus combination, for the two different quadrant possibilities, that factor becomes positive. The absolute value takes care of that for me. Okay, of course, taking the reciprocal, to get the derivative dy dx gets me 1 over the absolute value of x times the square root x squared minus 1. Okay, similarly, and I'll just write both chain rules here in summary, we've just determined that the derivative of secant inverse of u is going to be u prime over the absolute value of u times square root u squared minus 1. Similarly, we can say the derivative of cosecant inverse of u is equal to negative u prime over absolute value of u squared u squared minus 1. That gives us our six derivative formulas for those six inverse trig functions.
there's not much to discuss in terms of examples. Uh, you're going to apply these six formulas. And of course, we're going to have the typical mix of products and quotients and chain rules added. So for example, I guess we can just look at one quickly. If I said, let's take the derivative of something like, let's say, tan inverse of e to the x plus 2x. OK, what's my formula again for the derivative of tan inverse? And I'll write that over here to the side. The derivative of tan inverse of u is u prime over 1 plus u squared. So I just simply need to apply that formula. I'm definitely taking the u to be e to the x plus 2x. So that means the derivative should be e to the x plus 2. So that means my derivative should be e to the x plus 2 over 1 plus e to the x plus 2x. Now, that brings us to the more interesting part, which is integration. Interesting in that I'm going to have to do a little more work for some of these integrals than I'd obviously have to do for differentiation. But let's start out with the basic conclusion, which is if I know six derivative formulas, I automatically know six integration formulas. And let's write down what we know. In fact, I'm just going to write three of them. And you'll see why here in a minute. I know the integral of 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared du should be sine inverse u. And that's just reversing the derivative formula that said derivative of sine inverse was 1 over square root 1 minus u squared. Similarly, I should be able to say that the integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared du is tan inverse. And I should be able to say that the integral of 1 over, now, here's where we have to be a little careful. Our derivative of secant inverse x was 1 over the absolute value of x squared x squared minus 1. So I could certainly write my integral formula with the integrand containing that absolute value of x. Okay, but the way we're going to write it instead is to leave that x inside the integrand without an absolute value. But the absolute value is going to appear instead in the argument of the secant inverse function. I'm going to have to have that absolute value somewhere. And where it's going to appear, and I'm sorry, that should be x, not u. Where it's going to appear is going to be in the integrand. And you'll see how that works out here in a little bit. OK, now, how would I get cosine inverse, cotan inverse, and cosecant inverse? Well, I recall that the derivatives of those were the negatives of the derivatives of sine inverse, tan inverse, and secant inverse. So of course, that means I can definitely get the antiderivatives of the negatives of these three as cosine inverse, cotan inverse, and cosecant inverse. Or I could simply write the integral of the negatives of these three functions as the negatives of sine inverse and tan inverse and secant inverse. And so what I mean by that is if we took just one of those, let's say the first one, we're saying that we could definitely treat the integral of negative 1 over 1 minus u squared as the negative of the integral of 1 over square root 1 minus u squared, which by this formula would get me negative sine inverse u plus c. Or I could think of it as let's directly take the antiderivative of negative 1 over square root 1 minus u squared. And I know that, with the negative included, is the derivative of cosine inverse of u. OK, how can these both be correct? 
Well, I know that as long as these two basic antiderivatives only differ by a constant, that these would both be valid answers. And of course, what's that identity that we have again? Sine inverse of x plus cosine inverse of x equals pi over 2. So that means I could certainly write this second answer as pi over 2 minus sine inverse of x plus c. And notice that if I absorb this pi over 2 constant term into the additive constant of integration, the basic function that would be left would be negative sine inverse of x, which is precisely what I got when I looked at it that first way. So these are both correct answers. And that's because these two functions differ by a constant because of this identity. So in this class, the way I teach this and the way most books present it, they don't focus a lot on the antiderivatives that lead to cosine inverse, tan, I'm sorry, cosine inverse, cotan inverse, and cosecant inverse, because those are just the negatives of the derivatives for these three. So I will focus on these three formulas, which means I'm going to write almost all the answers that I get from these integration problems in terms of those three trig functions. But what we're saying is all of those answers could also be written in terms of the other three inverse trig functions. Okay, let's look at the general chain rule versions and these are the versions you'll see in the book and these are the versions you normally see in tables of integrals so let's start with the sine one which says the integral of 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared so notice I've changed that 1 under there to an a an a squared and it turns out the formula is going to be the sine inverse of u over a. So this is a more general formula that will allow us to integrate things where that radicand in the denominator isn't just 1 minus u squared. It could be 4 minus u squared or 9 minus u squared or any number minus u squared, any positive number. Okay, to see how that works, let's quickly look at this integral. Uh, let me write that denominator as a squared times 1 minus u squared over a squared. Assuming a is positive, then that means I can factor out an a in the bottom, in the denominator, which gets me a times the square root of 1 minus u squared over a squared, which I could write as u over a squared. If I let w equal u over a, then that means that dw equals 1 over a du. Notice 1 over a du is what I have right there. And then what's under the square root is 1 minus u over a squared, but u over a is w. Putting that all together, what do I have? I have dw in green over the square root of 1 minus w squared. And I know from our earlier formula that that's just sine inverse of w. But what is w? It's u over a. Okay, therefore, we can say again the integral of 1 over the square root of a squared minus u squared with respect to u is sine inverse of u over a. So for example, if I had the integral of du over the square root of 25 minus, let's say, 9x squared, I notice that that does match the form. I would take a squared to be 25. I would take u squared to be 9x squared. That means a taken as a positive value would be 5. And it means u 
would be 3x. Okay, in that case, I do need to have a du in this integral, which would be 3dx. And by the way, that means this should have been a dx. Sorry about that. And I can see that because I know to get the du, I'll need a 3dx. Compensate with one-third. And then what I have here is one-third times the integral of du, which is that guy, over the square root of 25, which is a squared, minus 3x quantity squared, which is u squared. And I know this should be one-third sine inverse of u over a. Well, u is 3x and a is 5. And that would be a simple application of this integration formula. Okay, let's look at the general formula for tangent. The general formula, of course, the one we came up with before was the integral of 1 over 1 plus u squared with respect to u was tan inverse u. This version is going to replace that one by a more generic constant term. So we're going to integrate 1 over the square root, again, of a squared plus u squared with respect to u. Again, assuming a is positive. If we do a similar factoring trick like we did before, I know that I could write that numerator as a squared times 1 plus, again, u squared over a squared. Again, it would make sense to let w equal u over a, since this guy right here definitely looks like u over a squared. And of course, that would mean that dw, again, is 1 over a du. Okay, notice there is a little difference this time. Instead of a single factor of a out here like we had in the last derivative, now I have two of them. I know one of them is needed for the dw. So let's write the integral this way. Let's say we have 1 over a integral du over a times 1 plus u over a squared. In fact, let me change that to a bracket. OK, putting that all together, what do I have? Well, clearly, these two make the dw. The 1 over a outside the integral will just be a multiplying factor outside the integral. What do I have inside the pair of brackets in the bottom? It looks like I have 1 plus u over a squared, which is 1 plus w squared. Putting that all together, I have 1 over a integral dw over 1 plus w squared. And I know the antiderivative of 1 over 1 plus w squared with respect to w is tan inverse of w. So this should be 1 over a tan inverse w plus c, which will be 1 over a tan inverse of w, which is u over a. Okay, and there is our general integration formula for a form that contains a denominator that looks like a positive constant plus u squared. The answer is going to be 1 over a tan inverse u over a. For example, just to do a quick one, suppose I had the integral uh, du, actually let's call it dx, over, let's say, 7 plus, um, now let's make it 16x squared. 
okay, I should recognize that the u is 4x. Now, where does the a squared have to come from? It's got to come from that positive constant term. Okay, that term isn't a square, at least not a perfect square, but I can still write it as a squared. I would take a to be the square root of 7. That way the u squared is the 16x squared, and the a squared is the 7, which means that denominator definitely looks like an a squared plus a u squared form. Okay, what's the other thing I need to make this work? I need the appropriate du. Well, since u was 4x, I can't forget about the 4 that will be necessary to make the du. Putting that all together, it looks like I've got 1 fourth integral du over a squared plus u squared. And the formula says that should be 1 fourth times 1 over a times tan inverse of u over a. In this case, that would be 1 fourth times 1 over the square root of 7 times tan inverse of u. Again, we said u was 4x over a, which was square root of 7. If you're checking one of these in the back of the book, then there are obviously ways that this could be simplified. Um, I don't really care about that. Obviously, I could rationalize the denominator here where that square root of 7 is. Not necessary to do. So it will be more than enough to say, let's say 1 over 4 square root of 7 times tan inverse 4x over square root of 7. And actually, there's not really anything wrong with that line right there that we landed on. Okay, that leaves us with the third case, which is the general version for secant inverse. And so that one is going to look like this. If I take the integral with respect to u of 1 over u times the square root u squared minus a squared. So again, the only thing I'm changing there is I'm changing the 1 in the simple form to an a squared. And I'll just say that the formula for that will be 1 over a secant inverse absolute value of u over a plus c. I'll leave this one for you to verify yourself, to convince yourself that that's the correct formula. And again, that would be based on the earlier simple version, which said that du over u square root u squared minus 1 should have an antiderivative of 1 over a secant inverse absolute value, I'm sorry, no a on that version, of u over a. And again, what we've done here in the general version is replace this 1 by an a squared. And what does that change in my formula? It inserts a 1 over a factor in front and a u over a inside. And of course, I am still making the mistake here of leaving the a in this basic form where that a is really 1. So let me change that. The general form down here is just this. And so what we're saying is if a was 1, you would have 1 over a secant inverse of absolute value of u over a. Okay, we did a couple of basic examples earlier that followed directly from the forms. They were easily recognizable, and it was just a matter of identifying the A and the U. Okay, let's do two or three examples where it's more difficult to determine what the U is. And there really is one basic trick for the kinds of integrals we're going to be looking at for determining the U. So let's look at this example to show you what I mean. Uh, let's look at the integral with respect to x of 1 over 3x squared minus 2x plus 5. 
Okay, now, if you think about the integrals that we've looked at, that is the, the three inverse trig function integrals, we know one of them involves a 1 over a squared plus u squared form. One involves a 1 over square root a squared minus u squared form. The other one involves a 1 over u square root u squared minus a squared form. And so as you're working these slightly trickier integrals in this section, the first thing you think about is which one of these forms might apply to this integral. Well, that's easy for this one. This is the only one that doesn't have a square root in the denominator. It does just have the sum of two squares, which I clearly don't have in this denominator. But if I think about something that you used to do a lot in college algebra, which was completing the square, uh, that might convince you when I say that, that it might be possible to somehow write that quadratic as the sum of two squares somehow. Okay, so what would that look like? It's pretty easy. I'll take the 3x squared minus 2x plus 5. And if you haven't done this in a while, or you haven't used completing the square in quite this way, I'll take this example slowly. The way I'll say to do this, or a suggestion here, would be to take the first two terms, just the first two. Let's factor that 3 out. That is, I'm trying to factor out the coefficient on the x squared term. If I factored that 3 out of just those first two terms, that would leave me 3 times x squared minus 2 thirds x. All right, now, review. If I have x squared minus 2 thirds x, how do I complete the square? You should recall that I need to take the coefficient on the x term, which is negative 2 thirds, take half of that, which is negative 1 third, and then square that. And when I do, I get 1 ninth. Okay, notice what happens when I add that number to this x squared minus 2 thirds x. You're automatically going to produce x minus 1 third squared because, of course, what happens when I take x minus 1 third times x minus 1 third? I get x squared. I get two of those minus 1 third x's, which gets me minus 2 thirds x. And then I get 1 third times 1 third, which is 1 ninth. So the trick here is if I have x squared, let's say plus or minus ax, what I'm doing is taking half of that coefficient on the x and then squaring that value, which gets me a squared over 4. If you add a squared over 4, this quadratic is now a perfect square. In fact, it's going to be x plus a over 2 quantity squared. This was your old method for manufacturing a perfect square out of nothing just by adding this special number. All right, let me erase our scratch work here. And let's go back to the number we determined, which was 1 ninth. All right, now. What I want to do is make that thing in the parentheses a perfect square. So I'm going to add that 1 ninth in there. So watch carefully. It's going to be 3 times x squared minus 2 thirds x plus 1 ninth. So that now this thing inside the parentheses is a perfect square. Okay, what left? what's left outside is the plus 5, right? Now, of course, I can't just change this expression to something new. That would be rewriting the function as something different. So I need to make sure that I'm not really changing the function. Well, what did I just change? I inserted a 1 ninth where there wasn't one before. And really, what I've inserted is 3 times 1 ninth. Because whatever number I insert here is going to be multiplied by the 3 that I factored on initially. So what I've really added to this function that was not there before
is a one-third. If I add one-third to a function, I also need to subtract one-third so that really what I'm doing is adding one-third and subtracting one-third, which means I've really added nothing. So the trick again was I factored out the coefficient on the x squared. Once I got this incomplete quadratic with the x squared term and the x term inside, I added the appropriate number to complete the square. When I multiply that number times the number I factored out, which was the 3, that shows me that what I've really added to this function is 1 third. I'm going to have to subtract that to keep the balance. If you put that all together, what you have is 3 times the x squared minus 2 thirds x plus 1 ninth minus 1 third plus 5. We already know the reason for doing this part. It was to create a perfect square. And we know that's x minus 1 third squared. What's this part out here? It's just some constant. In this case, 15 thirds minus 1 third, which would be 14 thirds. Okay, putting that all together, that means my original integral can be written as dx over 3 times x minus 1 third squared plus 14 thirds. And let me copy that to the next page. Okay, now, question. What's the form we were aiming for? We were thinking about the one that looks like du over a squared plus u squared. Um, notice there is one little thing in the way that's easy to fix. That's that 3 right there. Okay, that's easy. I could just factor the 3 out of that denominator. If I did, what would be left? Well, there would be an x minus 1 third squared. And then this term would leave me a 14 ninths. Notice that 3 times 14 ninths is 14 thirds. Okay, that means this integral now becomes dx over 3 times x minus 1 third squared plus 14 ninths. Let's just factor that 3 right out. And now I'm looking at the integral of 1 over x minus 1 third squared plus 14 ninths with respect to x. And now in the form I've written it, you should be able to clearly see the u squared and the a emerging. It looks like the u squared should be played by the x minus 1 third squared. In other words, u is x minus 1 third, which of course means du is just dx, which is nice. Okay, what's the a squared? Well, the a squared should be that 14 ninths, which means a should be the square root of that, which in this case would be square root of 14 over 3. So when I put it all together, what form do I have here? I definitely have one-third integral dx, which we said was just du, over the square root of u squared, which was the x minus one-third squared, plus a squared, which we said was the square root of 14 over 3 squared. Okay, what should that integrate back to? Well, again, if I go back to my formula up here in the right corner, the formula says that that should be 1 over a tan inverse of u over a. So in our case, we would get 1 third times 1 over a. Well, 1 over a would be 1 over the square root of 14 thirds, which would be 3 over the square root of 14.
times tan inverse of u, which is x minus one-third, over a, which is square root of 14 thirds. It's okay to leave the answer like that, but I think I'll clean it up just a little bit simply because there's some nice stuff there. I could certainly write that first part as 1 over the square root of 14. Tan inverse, if I multiplied both the numerator and the denominator by 3, uh, that would mainly be to clean up the square root of 14 over 3 and make it square root of 14. The top would become 3x minus 1. And that's about as good as that one's going to look. So the upshot here is from here on out, when I see the integral of a function where the integrand is just some sort of quadratic function, one of the possibilities is that that quadratic function could be something that's expressible as the sum of an a squared and a u squared if I get lucky when I complete the square. I just need to learn how to complete the square again and use it to rewrite that quadratic to see if I've got this form. If I do, I know my answer is going to be a tan inverse. Okay, let's look at another example. This one will be a little easier, I think. Let's try integral dx over x plus 2 quantity times square root of x squared plus 4x plus 3. Okay, again, if I think about the basic forms, that is, integrands that look like that contain things like 1 over a squared plus u squared or 1 over a squared minus u squared under a square root or 1 over u times the square root of u squared minus a squared. By the way, notice the important difference between these last two. They both contain square roots in the denominator, but notice this one has the constant term first and then the variable term in the subtraction, whereas this one has them reversed. And I just have to keep those straight. I know this is the one that leads to tan inverse, this is the one that leads to sine inverse. This is the one that leads to cosecant inverse. I'm sorry, secant inverse. Obviously, the other thing I need for this last one to work is to have that factor of u outside the square root. When I look at those three, it's not too hard to see that this last one is the one that looks like it matches this form. And if I take the obvious q, it looks like a choice of u equals x plus 2 would get me that factor that's sitting outside the square root. Okay, so the question is, if that was a u, is it possible to write this quadratic under the square root as a u squared minus a squared? And notice, here's the tricky part. In the last problem, I was trying to aim for a u squared plus a squared. What happens if I go to complete the square on this quadratic, and instead of writing or finding that it's a u squared minus a squared, I find that it's a u squared plus a squared? Then it doesn't match this form. In fact, it doesn't match any of these three. Um, that's a type that we'll be able to handle in the next chapter. So we are pretty rigid here. We're looking for integrals that match one of these three forms, and if it doesn't match one of those three, we don't know how to do it yet. Of course, all the ones in your homework are going to match one of these three forms. And if I think about x squared plus 4x plus 3, well, the only way that could have a u squared in it is if it had an x plus 2 squared in it. And I know x plus 2 squared is x squared plus 4x plus 4, that certainly looks like x squared plus 4x plus 4 minus 1. That is, if I was trying to write this x squared plus 4x plus 3, which means x squared plus 4x plus 3 is really just x plus 2 squared, which is this part, minus 1.
that means I have integral dx over square root x plus 2 quantity square root x plus 2 squared minus 1. Clearly, if u is x plus 2 and a is 1, then of course du is dx, and I certainly have integral du over u square root u squared minus 1. I know the answer for that should be 1 over a secant inverse absolute value u over a. In this case, of course, like that other one where I was goofing around, a is just 1 which means really what we're going to get is secant inverse absolute value of u. u is x plus 2, so my answer should be secant inverse of absolute value of x plus 2 plus c. Okay, let's look at one last example, just to sort of show you uh, how we might start working on a couple of different things in one of these integrals. So let's look at the integral of 2x plus 7 over x squared plus 2x plus 5. And of course, once you see this example, you'll remember this technique, and after you practice it, you'll know exactly how to integrate something like this. But this is always one of those times that's a good opportunity for you to take what you know with a new problem you've never seen before and see what you can come up with. Uh, and again, if we were in class, uh, I could give you cues and ask you some questions and try to force you to come up with some of this on your own. So as you're looking at this video, try to do that. Pause the video if you'd like and see if you can answer some of these questions. All right, what's the, the first most obvious substitution I might try if I'm thinking back through all of the different integration techniques we've learned so far? So I don't just mean these new inverse trig integrals. I also mean integrals that involved 1 over u, integrals that involved exponentials, and then going back to basic substitutions from Calc 1. Well, if you think about it for a minute, the first thing that might grab you, and we talked about this back in section uh, 6.2, when I see that denominator and I notice that it's degree 2, and I look at that numerator and see that that's degree 1, and I know that the derivatives of degree 2 functions are degree 1 functions, then the first thing I think about is, could the derivative of the denominator either be the numerator, or could the numerator at least contain enough material to make the derivative of the numerator, or rather denominator? So what I'm suggesting there is, what if I said u was equal to x squared plus 2x plus 5? It's a very simple substitution. If I was just trying some, it's one of the basic ones I would try. Okay, what's du? Well, it'd be 2x plus 2 dx. Okay, that's not what I have in the top. I have a 2x plus 7, but this is where I just have to learn to uh, think a little outside the box. I know 2x plus 7 does have a 2x plus 2 in it. It's just that it also has a 5. All right, since that 2x plus 2 and that 5 are both terms, that means I could split this entire integral into two terms. What would that look like? It would be the integral of 2x plus 2 over x squared plus 2x plus 5 plus the integral of 5 over x squared plus 2x plus 5. Okay, now, if you followed what we did there, then you can see that first integral is a really simple integral. It should just be a 1 over u du, or if you like, du over d, du over u. That's where u is the x squared plus 2x plus 5, and the du is the 2x plus 2 
dx. And I know the integral of that should be ln absolute value of u, which would be ln of x squared plus 2x plus 5. Okay, that takes care of the first one. But by breaking this integral into two pieces, I've created another integral to look at. So let's look at that one for a minute. So integral 5 over x squared plus 2x plus 5. Obviously, I can't do the same sort of substitution I just did. The denominator is quadratic. The numerator only contains a constant. So letting u be the denominator doesn't get me to any 1 over u integration. I already took care of that with this first part. Okay, so what other techniques do I have? Well, now we're back to the problems we just did a few minutes ago. That 5 is really not essential to the basic form. The basic form looks like a 1 over x squared plus 2x plus 5. And when I see an integrand that looks like 1 over a quadratic, the first thing I should be thinking about is completing the square. Since there is no square root in that, if I could get an a squared plus u squared out of that denominator, then I know this becomes a tan inverse form. So I'm back to completing the square. x squared plus 2x plus 5. I don't have to factor anything out because of a factor in front of the x squared. It's already just a 1. So that means the number I need to add to complete the square, well, what's the coefficient on the x term? It's a 2. And what's our method? Half of 2 is 1. And then 1 squared is 1. I need a 1 to have a complete square. And in this case, it would be x plus 1 squared. Well, of course, if I add 1, I have to subtract 1, which means this part out at the end will give me a plus 4. By the way, what's the other, perhaps simpler way to look at that? If I know a 1 is what must be added to complete the square, just take that 1 from the 5 that you have. When you do, what's left over is the 4. And what I have is x plus 1 squared plus 4. OK, let me erase our work there. So if you're OK on with how we got the x plus 1 squared over 4, let's go ahead and rewrite that integral. The integral now becomes integral 5 over x plus 1 squared plus 4. If u is x plus 1, then of course du is dx. I recognize that this constant term needs to be the a squared to get my a squared plus u squared. So that means a must be 2. So this is now 5 times the integral du over a squared plus u squared, which should be 5 times, and what was our formula for the antiderivative of 1 over a squared plus u squared with respect to u? It was 1 over a tan inverse of u over a. In this case, that would be 5 times 1 over a, which would be 1 over 2, times tan inverse of u, which was x plus 1, over a, which was 2. So I guess we've got 5 halves tan inverse x plus 1 over 2. OK, a lot to absorb there, but uh, the biggest key to the whole thing is getting a hold of that completing the square skill again. And once you've mastered that or remastered it, and you're able to recognize that every integral we're doing this homework is one of these three forms. Uh, the worst you're going to have to contend with is completing the square in a denominator. And then in this example, I've shown you that some of these integrals could possibly be split into subintegrals. And in that case, some of those subintegrals will involve our three inverse trig functions, whereas others may involve log 
techniques, as in integrals of 1 over u with respect to u. Okay, a good place to stop, and let me know if you have any questions.